Welcome to another episode of Sussex Sport Weekly Podcast. I'm Matt Pohl, and this week I'm joined by Brighton and Hove Albion writer Darren Howard, Crawley Town expert Mark Dunford, and Steve Bone, who covers all things sport in Sussex for our newspapers and online at sussexworld.co.uk. Brighton continued their stunning start to the Premier League season with a ruthless 4 1 win at Wolves on Saturday. Albion sit at the summit of the Premier League after two games, but their credentials will be severely put to the test this Saturday against the West Ham side who got the better of big spending Chelsea last weekend. We'll look ahead to the Seagulls clash with the Seagulls and we'll bring you all the latest from Crawley Town, the non-league football scene in Sussex, the Sussex Sharks one-day cup campaign and the Sussex Cricket League. But going back to last weekend, a stunning solo goal from Caro Matoma and a second-half double from Solly March helped Brighton coast to victory over 10-man Wolves at Monyu. It follows Albion's excellent 4-1 home win over newly promoted Luton Town on the opening day and I don't think even the most optimistic of Seagulls fan there and probably would have predicted this start for Brighton then. Just how good have they been over these past two games? Yeah, it's it's been a, a really good start. Um, the bigger tests are still still to come, I think, for for De Zerbe's team. But uh, you really can't argue with the with the start. Two um, two very good performances, creating plenty of chances, and um, you know they could have taken more. Really, they've got eight mm-hmm. goals from two games so far, and um, De Zerbe will look at that and think that they maybe could even be in double figures from uh, from those two games. But um, I think what what sort of pleased him the most is is that they he made three changes to the to the team that faced um um Luton Town on the opening day of the season so um Enciso came in Adam Webster came back in as as well and then Billy Gilmore came into the center of midfield and um it's three sort of key changes and um and and it really looked seamless still it's it just you know carried on from where they left off the style of play was the same uh, the creating of chances was the same, um, and I think that's what's that's what's going to bode well for the season. Last season, it was they were sort of just rolling the same sort of team out time and time again because they had limited options. But now, um, Deserby does have those options. They're looking to add another midfielder as well before the transfer window closes. Um, so in that respect, it looks really good. Uh, top of the league, um, six points in the bag. And also, just just to add as well, that the Matoma and Estupinian link on that left hand flank uh, mm. looks really good this this season as well. Matoma's goal against um, at Wolves is is one of the best I've I've seen for for a long while. Sort of individual efforts. It was it was a cracker. So um, so yeah, brilliant start, brilliant start. Well, may, maybe I've mentioned there, Darren, but one man who has shone for Brighton in his opening games is Solly March. Uh, the 29 year old now has four goals in two games and put on a stunning display at Molyneux in front of watching England manager Gareth Southgate. Um, I think it's safe to say Mark's been a huge beneficiary of De Zerbe, uh, working under Roberto De Zerbe, sorry, Darren. But how has he improved his game? And do you think a uh, three-lines call isn't out of the question after his start to the season? Well, I think he, he's certainly getting to that point now. He's He's been producing these performances over a sustained sort of period now under since De Zerbe has joined. And I think that consistency will... Um, will help him to get into um, to push for for Gareth Southgate's um, uh, team, uh, and, and it's just been. I think we touched on it last week. It's just what he's done under De Zerbe and how De Zerbe has improved him as a player. Um, has, has been, you know, one of the success stories of um, uh, of De Zerbe's time there. I think it's been brilliant. Um, before, you know, Solly March was always a good player. He was, a, you know, mm. a real solid professional player who you could rely on but De Zerbe's sort of taking him to another level now he's getting him into the positions on the on the pitch where he can really impact games his finishing is is so much more clinical now as well he looks he looks confident in front of goal and that that's that's the main thing he's he's set him a target of 15 15 goals this season and and you certainly wouldn't put it past him if he continues mm. to get into these positions as as well um, he, he perhaps doesn't sort of catch the eye, you know, when you're looking at attacking talent uh, in the Premier League. He's, he, you know, he, he doesn't he doesn't catch the eye like a, someone like a Rashford or Mo Salah or someone who's got this blister in pace. But he, he's technically so good, and um, and he's just improving all, all the time as, as well. So I think I think if he keeps going, he, he's going to become too good to ignore for, for Southgate, and he's he's, he's going to force uh, force his way into that uh, into that national national setup. Do you think his chances are boosted by the fact that Brighton are now seen as quite trendy and quite fashionable? And things I, I think it certainly better. helped. Yeah, mm. it's the Brighton's profile has really, really increased um, in in the last sort of few months. Uh, qualification and playing Euro- into the Europa League and playing European football as well will will certainly help his cause. But um, 
you know, while Brighton are competing at that top end of the table, um, then, yeah, I think him and a few other players, if they have a consistent season, will, will come into the England uh, England pitcher as well. Lewis Dunk should be mm. uh, should be within in, in there as well. Um, and then perhaps Adam Webster, if he can have a run of games, he could get back into the conversation again. But then you're also looking away from the England setup as well, like Jao Pedro as well. Like Deserby said, look, mm. you you are you should be pushing for the national team as well. So the, there's a lot of players there, Billy Gilmore as well, who really want to establish themselves in uh, in the Brighton team, which in turn would help boost their national chances. Uh, well, on the transfer fund, Dan, you mentioned it there. Albion reportedly close to sealing a move for Lille midfielder Carlos Belaver. Uh, the Seagulls are reportedly on the verge of completing a £25.6 million deal for the 19-year-old Cameroonian. Um, can you tell us a bit about Believer, please, Darren? And is he viewed as the Cubs' placement for Moises Caicedo? He, he is. Um, so he's, yeah, so he's, he's only young. He's 19, 19 years old. And um, he, he's really impressed in, in League One with uh, with Lille. He's he's that sort of player that can offer the protection to the to the back line as well. He's um, he's comfortable on the ball, good in, good in possession. And he can um, take the ball from the defenders, from the goalkeeper, and turn in those in those sort of congested areas and get the attacks uh, attacks going forward. So, yeah, it looks as though Brighton had agreed a fee with with Lille for for him, but it, it seems to have stalled a bit. I think the progress has um, has slowed down. Uh, his manager Paolo Fonseca this week uh, or yesterday said that he knows there's a possibility that he will leave. Um, but um, but they've got a European Conference qualifier to play, and he fully expects um, Baliba to be in his his team for that. And he's fo- said he's fully focused on on that. But um, he still thinks the deal can be done. It has gone a bit quiet, I think, because clubs Brighton tend to do their business. They they like to sign their players before they sell. So mm. now that every club's going to be squeezing Brighton for an extra extra few pence mm-hmm. because they know they've got this Caicedo money in the bank. So. So I think that may have sort of slowed down the progress of this this transfer. So it has it has gone a bit quiet, and they've since been linked with a player from uh, from Arsenal as as well to uh, who can perhaps come in. But um, but yeah, we'll we'll hope to see. We've still got a you know another week or so left of the transfer window, but it's it's an area that Brighton are are active, actively looking to um, uh, to to add to to their team. Deserby wants a Caicedo type yeah. replacement in you know before. The window closes. Oh, well, speaking of Caicedo, the Ecuadorian and his former Albion teammate Robert Sanchez endured a torrid time against Brighton's forthcoming opponents West Ham last weekend with the new club Chelsea. The Hammers claimed a 3 1 home win over the Blues despite playing over half an hour with 10 men. Uh, Caicedo came off the bench to make his Chelsea debut and made an immediate impact, uh, but probably not the impact he wanted, conceding a penalty in the second half stoppage time, which was duly dispatched. I'm sure a lot of Albion. Uh, Spores are probably feeling very sorry for Casado about his debut, but anyway, the Hammers will no doubt be buoyed by the result against the Blues, Darren. Um, so, who are the uh, West Ham danger men out in should be wary of? And are you predicting a sterner test or the sternest test so far for Brighton? Yeah, it, it will be. It will be. I thought West Ham have had a good start to the season. They've carried on from there. They had a poor campaign last year in the Premier League, but the um, winning the Europa Conference League seems to have. Um, you know, installed a lot of confidence into into the players, and they they've started the season well. They look uh, look very strong. Uh, they obviously lost Declan Rice, but I think James Ward Prowse has been a, a really really good signing uh, for West Ham, and he, he's come into the midfield. And some of his deliveries from set pieces against Chelsea, from yeah. even, whether it's a corner free kick, he's just on the money every every time. And I think that's something Brighton will have to be very wary of. Um, He's a player that I'd love to have seen Brighton actually go for this this summer. Um, but, you know, Brighton don't spend 30 million plus on 28-year-olds. So, uh, you know, it's it's one of those. I, I know West Ham, I think he's going to be a, a really good player for West Ham this yeah. season. Uh, and he's a player that Brighton are going to have to watch out for. Uh, Antonio, he, he also looked a real handful uh, up front as well. He looked back, back to his best. He plays in that lone uh, attacking role and um when when he's when he's good he's he's very good and i think he's um he's going to cause a lot of trouble for uh, for lewis dunk and if it's adam webster playing as well i think they've got their work cut out to to look after him and uh lucas paqueta as, as well he's um he's obviously been linked with this move to manchester city and he's had his trouble with these betting allegations mm. as as well but he played against chelsea with a as though he had a real point to prove, and um, I think he's—he looks a man on a mission at the moment as well. So I think 
I think there's still possibilities that in a, that move to Manchester City could still go ahead if once he's cleared from these FA, if he gets cleared from these FA betting charges, and that, that's a big if at the moment. But um, yeah. but yeah, he's he looks a player that's you know very technically very good, uh, and the way he links up with Ward Prowse and that Antonio combination as well, uh, very good. Yeah, I think I think it'd be uh, it'd be it'd be a tough test for Brighton, but they're they're going to be you know full of confidence going into this one again. Uh, finally, before we move on to Crawley Town, Darren, very quickly, how have they stacked on the injury front going into the game against West Ham? Um, so far, so good. They've had a blow in in midweek um, with um, Julio Enciso. He's uh, apparently pulled up with a with a knee injury uh, in training, uh, a reported meniscus tear. But uh, we're waiting for confirmation on the club as to how serious uh, it is. We'll probably find out more in a press conference on on Friday. Um, but that, that's going to be a blow for Brighton. He was, he was really good against, against Wolves. Um, some of the other players may took the headlines, but Deserby was quick to say after the game that he thought Enciso was the best player on the pitch uh, mm. at Wolves. Um, so yeah, it, it would be a blow for him because he's, this was going to be his breakthrough season in the Premier League. He showed glimpses of his uh, talent last, last season. He's, he's, he's now sort of established. He knows how, how it all works at Brighton, and this was going to be a big year for him. So, so if there is an injury to him, that's a blow. Um, I think it will also um, have repercussions for uh, Bornetti as well. He was about to go out on loan uh, with Leeds being linked with him. But I think if uh, Nciso is injured, I think you'll see Bornetti uh, remain at the club this uh, this summer. So, and then just another piece of transfer news as well: young Irish player uh, Andrew Moran. He's uh, mm. he's probably going to go to Blackburn. He's uh, Ireland under 21 international, very good player. Um, was in and around the first team last season in the match day squads, got on a couple of times in the Premier League. Uh, but he's going to, he, he looks as though he's going to seal a lone move to uh, to Blackburn Rovers. And uh, yeah, they've got a good player there if they get him for the season. Well, hopefully he has the same sort of impact that Jan Paul Van Heck had at Blackburn because he didn't do badly, did he? he, he, he yeah, that, he really established, he made, him, he made his name at, at Blackburn. They were really uh, I think he got player of the season there on mm. his year on loan, um, Van Hecker. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, it, it just shows that, you know, have a good year in a championship and then, you know, it can really help set you up for, um, you know, potential uh, career and a new contract with, with Brighton. Well, fingers crossed for him. Uh, moving on to Crawley Town, uh, the Reds suffered their first loss of the League Two campaign last Saturday, going down 1-0 at home to a Gillingham side that boasted former Reds favourites, Ashley Nelson, Tom Nichols and Glenn Morris among their squad. Harry Ransom own goal consigned the Reds to their first home defeat in nearly six months, uh, but Crawley's frustrations were compounded by an early penalty miss from Dom Telford. Um, what's the reaction been to the defeat, Mark? Um, looking at the stats, it seems as if the Reds should have at least got a point. They battered them in terms of shots and possession and all those kind of things. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was disappointing. The result. I wasn't actually there, but looking at all the reaction and that, um, yeah, Crawley battered them. Mm. And by all accounts, um, that's what Gillingham have done in their first. They've won every game one nil so far. They're top of the league. Scored, uh, yeah, one four. Uh, scored four goals, let in none, and got twelve points. So, but yeah, Crawley had sixty eight percent possession, seventeen shots compared to Gillingham's nine. Seven shots on target to Gillingham's three. Nine corners compared to four. So mm. everything was there. But as Scott Lindsay said afterwards, the only stat that matters is the scoreline, and it was one nil. Uh, so yeah, really disappointing. Yeah, I mean, the Dom Telford came in for a bit of stick from some Corey mm. fan thing, take him off penalty duty straight away. He's he's playing a slightly different role this year, he's dropped back. Um, they're sort of playing a four, I've got to work it out now, four, three, two, one. So Telford and Darcy just behind Orsi. Mm. Um, say that 10 times fast. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, he's. I mean, when I saw him against MK Dons, he was involved in both goals, dropping back. He's comfortable on the ball, he lays off the ball well, and that. But ever since he came to Crawley, what's sort of let him down is his lack of goals and his finishing. And obviously, mm. that would have been the perfect chance for him to get a bit of confidence, get the ball in the back of the net, but missed that penalty. And yeah, fans are calling for someone different to take. And Nick Sarula took a penalty and scored in the pre-season. And yeah. Nick Sarula's been Crawley's best player so far, um, I would say. So yeah, um, yeah, huge shame they lost. But it is, I think Liam Kelly said after the game, it is literally only a bump in the road. It's a game they should have won. They showed that they can play against the top team. Um, and they proved that against Bradford and MK Dons as well. And Salford. 
Mm. So uh, yeah, off to Swindon this weekend. So uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, it was, a sh- it was just a shame because it would have been great if they just k- kept on that unbeaten start, even with a draw, um, mm. unbeaten home run. But uh, yeah, uh, they move on. Uh, it's, yeah, Scott Lindsay's looking for a reaction now, and I'm sure he'll get it from this team of players. Yeah, well, I was going to mention the clash with Gillingham. Unfortunately, suffered from some unsavoury um, moments both on and off the pitch. <laughs> Uh, the match ended controversially with Jill's assistant boss David Livermore receiving a yellow card after preparing to strike Crawley's Ronan Darcy in the face. And in a separate incident, uh, Crawley were forced to issue a statement following the game after they were made aware of certain threats and abuse made to a former Reds player. Uh, the fact that a former Crawley favourite has been subjected to this kind of abuse is shocking, isn't it, Mark? Um, can you tell us a little bit more about these incidents, please? Yeah, it's just very sad, really, mm. and pathetic, to be honest. I mean, Ashley Naderson. Everybody was like, oh, God, and, um, when he left, they were gutted. He left kind of thing. And then as soon as he comes back, should him and the likes of Tom Nichols and Glenn Morris should all get a little bit of a hero's welcome. Yeah. They were all part of that team that beat Leeds United famously yeah. 3-0 in the FA Cup. And he comes back and I believe there was some chat in the stands and just sort of mocking and that. But then I've I've been sent screenshots of death threats he was sent. I mean... Yeah. It's a little keyboard, sad keyboard warrior sent at home, obviously just doing it. I mean, it's, it doesn't matter if there's any intention behind it or not. No. Like, as in, like, they're going to act on it. They're not. But it is just, it, it's, it's horrific. And play, it, it is, I mean, they're not the only ones. It happens week in, week out with footballers, I'm sure, mm. across the country, all at different levels as well. But, yeah, so Crawley Town are investigating it. They should obviously put out a statement saying they strongly condemned it. And, um, yeah. Any, any individual, if they find who it is and get hold of the individuals, they'll be banned from the club and that, which is the least that should happen. But this is the kind of thing that I think police should be involved with. Mm. And yeah, and just, yeah, it's it's just so, so sad. I mean, anyone who knows Ashley Addison, he, he put his heart and soul into Crawley Town. Didn't have the best of seasons last year, but um, when him and Tom Nichols and Dom Talford and all that were on fire together, it was great to watch. And yeah, he'll go down in history because he scored one of the goals against Leeds United um, in that game. So, um, and he is a homegrown boy. So when he comes back here, mm. I mean, it just leaves such a sour taste. I was going to say, Mark, does it make it doubly sad that the fact that he is a local boy, he is the mm. definition of a local boy for Crawley, isn't he? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And he's got a, he's got a young family as well. He got married, I think he got married last summer mm. um, and that, and yeah, and he, they, his family see those sort of messages and that as well. It's, it's just, it just is going to hurt him, sort of thing. And he's, yeah. And it does. Next time he plays Crawley, he's probably going to get one well over them. Yeah, of course. Just because because of the fans, and it's just, yeah, it's just such a shame that, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not one of these people that sign up to players shouldn't celebrate when if they score or mm. if they think. And I think, yeah, you play for a football team, you score, you should celebrate yeah. in that. But that doesn't mean that they deserve any abuse or anything or death threats or anything like that. I don't think it's just. Just sad and pathetic. And the sad thing is it is someone sitting at home on their computer just getting really angry about football. I mean, it's just a game, isn't it? It's just a game. <laughs> Maybe I should care more, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very, very sad. And it's quite disturbing, really. Some of the messages that I saw the screenshot of were just, yeah, horrific. Terrible. Not nice at all. Yeah. Well, hopefully you can get excited about this, Mark. Uh, this weekend sees the Reds travel to Scott Lindsay's former club, Swindon. Uh, the Robins sit 13th in League Two with five points in three games. Uh, how do you see this one going, Mark? And how are the Reds stacked in terms of injuries for their trip to Wiltshire? Um, I'm guessing there probably won't be as much of a fiery reception for Scott Lindsay as there probably was last time if there was one at all. No, I don't think so at all. Because Swindon have had a, an OK start. They, um, what have they? I think they haven't lost yet. They've only played the three games, one, one, yeah. drawn two. Obviously, they had that incredible game with Wrexham last weekend where they drew five all. Um, but yeah, I think Scott Lindsay. I think I think it was good that he had that trip to Swindon at the end of last season, last game of last season. Sort of that breaks the ice kind of thing, and he can go mm-hmm. back now. And both sides have hopefully moved on. Um, is it Michael Flynn at Swindon now, the Wolves so. manager? Yeah. So, uh, but um, I mean, the good thing is Scott Lindsay, and he's talked about continuity and consistency, and that. I think Kellen Gordon is probably still the only real injury doubt. He. He's the only change um, that Scott Lindsay has made to the starting eleven in in a league game this year. Um, he had a he picked up a hamstring injury against um, MK Dons, so Adam Campbell came in for him Saturday. I can't imagine, given how well Crawley performed on Saturday, that there will be many changes. But 
obviously with Swindon scoring five, there's obviously a goal threat there. I mean, mm. Wrexham, they've yet to settle. I mean, Wrexham, they've played for, scored 13, let in 13 in their first four games. So I don't know how much we can read into how potent Swindon's attack are compared to how bad Wrexham's defence is. But um, yeah, it's yeah, it'll be it'll be a tough game. Swindon will obviously want to keep up their unbeaten run, but Crawley will go there with no fear at all. They they're a team playing with confidence. The only thing that is letting them down is their finishing. Yeah, and I I asked Scott Lindsay about that last week or the week four, and just said, "Are you is that a concern that you're not scoring as many goals as you should do?" And he said, "It's." his only concern would be when they're not creating as many chances as they are. So I think he strongly believes that at some point it is going to click and who knows, there could be five this weekend for Swindon Lennon and another five. Mm. Yeah, but uh, it, it won't be an easy game, but I, I expect Crawley to get something at Swindon. Uh, finally, on the Crawley front, um, do you see Crawley dipping into the transfer market before it closes next week? And the other, the other ways, do you see any players potentially leaving? Yes, yeah, so, um, when I asked I asked Scott Lindsay this last week, and he said that they are definitely looking for to add one more, at least one more, probably two. But it's hard to see who goes out mm. if they are if, if that's what they need to do, one in, one out kind of thing. So yeah, maybe they're still. I think they're probably still looking for that goal scoring striker, um, and maybe just shore up the defence a little bit because that's where maybe if they get a couple of injuries, that's where they're probably a little bit weaker. So, um, yeah, but um, yeah, who goes out? I don't know whether it'll be a loan thing or mm. from some of the fringe players. But uh, he talked about last week how important the squad as a whole is and the substitutes who came on, like Adam Campbell when he came on against MK Dons, Clive Lotos. Um, mm. Yeah, so yeah, it's difficult to see. He's got such a re- this squad seems to be meticulously put together, like. Last year, there just seemed to be players coming in from everywhere on loan and mm. blah, blah, blah. Um, but this year, it seems so well put together that I don't yet whether it's just going to be two more added in and that's it kind of thing. And we'll see. But uh, it'll be, yeah, it'll be interesting to see who they do get in. But uh, yeah, it is just that finishing that they need to strengthen, I think. And But if they could get a 20 goal a season striker, they would have gotten by now probably. So mm. there's probably not many left on the market available. <laughs> And there's teams with a lot of money in that league. Um, yeah. You know, big clubs who would, if there was somebody available, they would have snapped them up by now. So, yeah, interesting. Do you think that they'll also take some, going back to the recruitment, do you think they'll also take some satisfaction in the fact that the players that they have brought in from non-league, who supporters have said, oh, they'll never cut it in League Two, they've not looked out of their depth, have they, so far? Not at all. They um they have all gelled perfectly. I mean, something like Jay Williams. Mm. I said Nick. Well, my, I personally think Nick Sarula is the best player in the team and that. But Jay Williams has probably put in the most consistent performances so far in dropping uh, the sort of uh, the central defense, uh, defensive midfielder and just breaking up play, getting involved. Nearly scored against MK Dons with a header. He's been great. Clyde Lolos, I think potentially he is going to be quite the player to watch just glide just a couple of glimpses against mk dons he glided past players and um that and yeah just a lot and yeah the fans they did every time somebody left like in the summer it was like all doom and gloom and then mm. now and scott Liff- Lindsay referenced it last week about because danilo orsi's already got his own song um and they're all <laughs> cheering for all these players and scott Lindsay said yeah the fans have seen already that these players are can play at this level. So, yeah, is I'm I am surprised how quickly they have all settled and how quickly they've gelled and playing really good football together. So, yeah, no, it's really good to see and hopefully the atmosphere at the club. Assuming no former players are coming back in the next few weeks, um, <laughs> is all going to be great and fine. And it and just on that, the fans um apparently later on at some point there is going to be an announcement about a fan representation on the board at Crawley Town. So. Mm. Um, I, I don't think it's been uh, revealed yet, it's released yet. So um, there will be some news later on that. So that's good news if the if the Wagme United have got someone on the board from the fans representing the fans, and then they can have a real say in that. So hopefully there'll be better communication between the two. Fingers crossed. We'll keep our eyes peeled. <clears throat> um, but sticking with football, uh, Worthing suffered their first loss of the National League South campaign, going down two one at home to newly promoted Avely last Saturday. 
Uh, the, Re the Reds remained top of the division, but the defeat at Woodside Road was not without controversy, was it, Steve? You're right. Um, it wasn't. <clears throat> uh, Worthing had a very poor first half and were 2-0 down at the break. A couple of very sort of straightforward goals by Avery that, that Worthing manager Adam Hinchman wasn't too happy about. But 10 minutes into the second half, Worthing were having a bit of a go, awarded a penalty. The penalty was put away. Players from both sides encroached into the area before the penalty was taken. It was one of those where the taker did a little shuffle on the way up. So players went into the area. That's probably why players encroached. But the penalty was scored. The penalty was not ordered to be retaken. It, the referee gave a free kick to Avely, which was the incorrect decision because it should have been because it was scored it should have been retaken I must admit i had to look look up the rules just to check i asked our, for some reason i asked our resident cricket umpire what all the rules were <laughs> and he had to look it up as well don't tell anyone but he, he wasn't too sure either um so if the penalty had been missed then fair enough that would have been a free kick to Avely for encroachment but it was scored a clear mistake by the referee who also by the way consulted his linesman who, mm. who seemingly didn't sort of put him right um worthing did then score about five minutes later they got back into it got back into it at 2-1 couldn't mm. find an equalizer though so first defeat of the season for them adam hinshaw was very fair afterwards he said yes it, that was a clear dis a clear mistake by the referee could have cost us because if we got a goal a bit earlier we'd have had a bit more momentum but he also said you know we've got to look at ourselves as well we defended very poorly played very poorly in the first half uh and and that's kind of the main reason why we lost so a bit of a setback for them but they are still top of the table on goal difference so it's not all bad well also in the national league south uh working <laughs> Barra also suffered a 2-1 home defeat last Saturday, losing out to Bath City. Uh, how's it been going for the sport so far this season, Steve? It seems to have started positively and possibly tailed off a little bit. Yeah, uh, that's a good summary. Um, they had a very good pre-season, as we've said on here before. Won their first game with, with quite an energetic display against Hampton and Richmond. Since then, they've got a, they've had a draw at Farnborough, which wasn't a bad result in the first away game. But they then lost to Avely. Uh, Avely are beating everybody this year. Watch out for Avely. Could be surprise promotion contenders. Um, so Eastbourne Borough lost at Avely. And then, as you say, last weekend, lost at home to Bath City. So, it, yeah, it has its... The, the, the bright star and some of the optimism has, has disappeared a little bit uh, but we've got a piece on the back of the Eastbourne Herald this week out on Friday um, with basically the within the borough camp they're not they're not panicking at this stage it's very early days you've got a completely new team still sort of learning about each other um, they're, they're playing well you know they haven't played Badly last weekend to lose to Bath. They were a bit unlucky in the second half not to, you know, but like Worthing, perhaps they, they could easily have snatched a point from the game um, or, or even gone on to win it. Um, everybody in National South, along with a lot of other non league divisions, has got two games this weekend, mm. playing Saturday and Monday. So I think for, for Eastbourne Borough, that, that will be a good chance. They're playing, I think they're playing Truro and Chelmsford be a good chance to get back on track. And you know, they're 19th in the table at the moment, which sounds below par but if they win a couple of games they'll be up to fifth or sixth so you know it's as as borough are saying it's early days no need to uh, to worry just yet uh, well meanwhile 10 sussex clubs discovered their respective fa cup first qualifying round opponents on monday uh, preliminary round winners new haven lansing eastbourne united stenning and burgess hill were joined by isthmian premier clubs bogner horse and hastings lewis and white Hawk in the draw uh, how has the draw panned out for our side, Steve? Have we got a good chance of having a healthy Sussex contingent in the next round? <clears throat> um, yeah, reasonable. Um, all the sides from step three who have come in, the Isthmian Premier sides, have all been drawn away. Mm. Um, so we've only got three Sussex teams at home in the next round. They are Eastbourne United, who will play Epsom and Mule, Burgess Hill, who will play Bogner in a nice Sussex derby. That's probably the, the pick of the ties in Sussex. Um, <clears throat> and Lansing are at home as well. They're playing Carl Shulton. Uh, so tough games for those three um, step four and five teams at home. And then you've got, you know, just looking at where some of the Isthmian Premier teams are going to. Horsham are going to Leatherhead, where you would think they'd be favourites to win. Same for Whitehawk at Seven Oaks. Hastings United are going to Erith and Belvedere. Uh, Lewis are going to Faversham. So you could make a case for all five of the Isthmian Premier teams, although they've got away games, some of them might need replays. They mm. should go through, really. Uh, I think Burgess Hill, with, with Dean Cox in charge, will, will relish taking on Bogner, 
who haven't had the best of starts to the season, so there could be a little upset there. Um, New Haven and Stenning, obviously the other two sides from Step Five, they're both they're both away. Um, but you'd hope for at least five of those ten clubs going through, which means plenty more Sussex interest in the in the next round of the cup. With um, as we've said before, Eastbourne Borough, yes. Worthing, and then later on Crawley and Brighton still to come in. So, <clears throat> yeah, the cup the, the cup magic lives on at least for now. Good stuff. That's what I like to hear, Steve. Um, moving on to cricket, um, Sussex Sharks uh, again snatched defeat from the jaws of victory in their final one day cup group game between 23 against Warwickshire on Tuesday. Uh, the one wicket defeat at home saw the Sharks finish rock bottom of Group B, having won just one of their eight one day cup games. Uh, it's not been a great tournament, Steve, um, to put it politely, for last season's uh, semi finalists. Um, would you say the defeat to Warwickshire pretty much summed up their campaign in the one day cup? It- it does in a way. Um, they had two chances, two good chances to take that last Warwickshire wicket and win, finish with a win, didn't take them. And then Danny Briggs, ironically, ex-Sussex player, ex-Sussex and Hampshire player, hit the winning runs. Um, but I saw a comment from Adrian Harms, who covers Sussex for hmm. BBC, Radio Sussex, and sorry, uh, which I thought was quite good. He described it as a morale-boosting defeat. <laughs> and, and by that, he, he, he means... At least it was close. At least Sussex had a go, pushed a good team in Warwickshire all the way, which in some games in that competition, they just haven't this season. They've absolutely surrendered. Mm. Um, Paul Farbrace has, has been quite critical of his players and and himself, in fairness. Uh, they've, they've lost heavily to teams like Gloucestershire, Worcestershire, Durham. Um, you know, games that you would think after how well they did last year in that competition, they could have, they, they should have been winning. Um, so yeah, a lot of lessons to be learned from that. They they will look at the balance of the team. You know, did they have enough experience in there? Tom Haynes' captaincy has to be looked at. You know, what yeah. was he, could he have done things differently and better? Um, and I'm sure they'll look to 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 get back to something like winning form in that competition next season. The the one thing that Sussex have still got to play for, um, and it's a it's a very important thing, is county championship. They've got four yeah. matches left. Every chance of promotion to Division One if they can, if they can get a couple of wins from these last four games, first of which is against Durham starting Sunday week, then you know if you can get promotion in the county championship, then it's been a successful season, whatever the shortcomings in the 2020 and the mm. One Day Cup. But yeah, they will want to forget that One Day Cup campaign pretty quickly, and I think most Sussex fans probably will too. I can't remember where I saw it, Steve, but I saw um, an article saying that Paul Farbrace had been linked with a return to Kent. Can you see that happening, or do you think he will stick it out for the long haul, Paul Farbrace? Yeah, he, it, those reports came out a week or so ago, and he was asked about it after they'd had one of their disastrous defeats. And mm. he said, nothing in it. I'm not going to be Kent's next director of cricket. That's it, yeah. Uh, and he then said, I'm staying here unless I get shown the door, <laughs> because they they had just left heavily. So I think he had to sort of, uh, you know, he, he wasn't sure at that stage if Sussex still w- would still want him, but I'm sure Sussex aren't going to get rid of him. So, it, yeah, I mean, you never know. These links, sometimes no smoke without fire is there. Um, mm. might, might be something in it, but certainly for now, he doesn't seem to have any plans to go to Kent or anywhere else. Uh, and hopefully he'll be around next year to continue the job that he started at Sussex. Well, fingers crossed. Uh, and finally, we are now on the home straight in the Sussex Cricket League and with just two weekends of cricket to go. Cookfield are just about on the cusp of wrapping up the Premier League division title, aren't they, Steve? <clears throat> they are. They could have done it last weekend um, had they won. Um, didn't manage it last weekend, but they are still, with so with two games to go, they are 40 points clear, 4-0 points clear of both Preston Nomads and East Grinstead, who are, who are level behind them. So... It's still the case that one more win for um, Cookfield will do it. They're away to Bogner this Saturday. Mm. Bogner have struggled this season and and particularly recently had a big defeat against Eastbourne uh, last weekend. Cookfield will, I think, fancy their chances of just... If they go, as long as there's no nerves um, creep in, I think if they can play the way they've been playing all season, they should be able to get the job done at Bogner. Having said that, uh, East Grinstead uh, and Nomads... We'll, we'll both be keeping an eye on that result, um, trying to win their own games um, and take it at least to the last weekend. But um, Cookfield have led from the you know from the off, and it'd be be a shame, real shame for them if they blew it now. I don't think they will. I think they will probably, with apologies to Bogner if they're watching this, I think they will probably get the job done this weekend. 
And how are things looking at the other end of the table too, Steve, in the Premier Division? It looks like people yeah. might be pulling off a bit of a great escape. Well, Eastbourne have given themselves a chance with a with what was quite a big win over Bognor, you know, hundred and something runs last weekend. Uh, Mayfield are almost down and out. Would would need to win both their last two games handsomely and hope that others slipped up. Eastbourne also still need a bit of a miracle. Really, they need to win their last two. They need to hope that Bognor don't win either of their last two, and that's what could happen. Eastbourne could still catch Bognor. What goes in Eastbourne's or against Eastbourne, I suppose, is that Bognor. No, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting myself confused. What goes in Eastbourne's favour is that Bognor are playing Cookfield this weekend, yeah. so they can play their game knowing there's every chance Bognor could lose, and, and that again could take it to the last day. And if you, you know, any of these title or relegation deciders, once you're in the last day, nerves do creep in and funny things happen it's the same in football isn't it you see all sorts of freak results so that that will be the aim for some of our teams this weekend just to keep keep the fight going and keeping it interesting for our papers steve more importantly oh yes <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, division two looks interesting as well doesn't it mark what are the key games this weekend <clears throat> so um the top game is uh the top two are facing each other that's worthing v hastings it's a game i'm umpiring so that's why i wanted to talk about it um <laughs> but yeah basically if worthing win they win the title and are promoted so uh it's a big day for worthing is at worthing so they would be favorites going into it but hastings had a big uh very important win against west chiltington who are the mm -hmm. other team involved in the title title race so worthing are currently 32 points ahead of west chiltington and 23 points ahead of Hastings. So, yeah, Worthing win, they're up. If Worthing lose um, and West Chiltington win, therefore Hastings would have beaten Worthing. It becomes very interesting. It becomes a really interesting final day. But if uh, West Chiltington lose, and depending how many bonus points they get, Hastings, could, Hastings and Worthing could both be promoted this weekend, oh, no right. matter what happens. So, uh, um, yeah. So it's uh yeah it's an it's an interesting one and um, Worthing have done so well this year they've won they've won, they've only lost one of their uh, sixteen games so far um, whereas you look at Hastings have lost five West Chillington have lost three so Worthing if they do win on Saturday they will be worthy winners and they've got a really good team um, like Nick Ballamy who came back from Bognor last year he he was playing in the Premier last year with Bognor he came back um, to his home club uh, Dominic Clapp's been playing more this year Daryl Rabetz who was captain of East Grinstead mm. when they won when they won the Premier Division. So he's a really good player. And Harry Dunn, we talked about him. He, he has been fantastic, taking five, six wickets every week. He's left arm spinner, really good. So yeah, it's gonna be interesting if they go up again next year. It'd be good in a way, and I'm not I have not got any skin in this game. But if Hastings went up because if Mayfield and Eastbourne come down, there's mm. no East Sussex representation in the Premier Division. So it'd be really nice if there was that East Sussex representation. But yeah, if it doesn't, it doesn't. That's the way it goes, isn't it? But at the other end of the table as well, there's still three, to, three teams who could feasibly drop down. Brighton and Hove, incredibly, are already relegated. Really? Um, yes, they're already down. So it's between Burgess Hills, Chichester Priory Park and Crowhurst Park, the three that can go down. There's only 10 points separating those three. The last game of the season is Burgess Hill v Chichester. So, depending what happens this weekend, that game could be huge next week. Uh, so, yeah, it's three teams go down and then one to, one from each of Division 4, three East and West go up. And then there's a playoff between the second place of um, the Division 3 East and West. And Division 3 West, if you want to look at a very tight um, table, there are three teams vying for one promotion, automatic promotion. Highfield, Stenning and Finden. I think there's five or six points separating the three of them and they all within the next two games play each other as well so it's a really thrilling end to the division three uh west uh, uh division so uh, yeah no it, it's great to get to this point of the season with so many different uh things that can happen but uh yeah no it should be a good one between worthing and hastings this weekend my game of the week yeah <laughs> uh touching on the division two mark would it be a bit of a shock if either chichester or burgess hill but to go down, they're relatively biggish names, aren't they, in that division? They are, especially when you consider you've got the likes of Buxted Park and Crowhurst Park who came up. Haven't been up at that level for quite a while, I don't think, either of those. So, yeah, it would be, especially with Brighton going down as well. I mean, Brighton yeah. is a huge name. They've been in the Premier Division for years. 
go down one league and they drop down another. But we've seen it happen. But I feel did exactly the same thing. They were in the Premier Division and dropped down two divisions in the consecutive seasons. But yeah, Burgess Hill, they've been a staple in Div 2 for quite a while. Just a private park app as well. So, and uh, yeah, but it is a really tight division. I mean, there's sort of only, what is there? Between ninth and second, there's like 90 points. And when you consider in the Premier Division, there's a much bigger gap between the bottom line and the top lot. So it's a really tight division and it is fine margins. But yeah, it will be quite a shock if either of those go down. But if you look at the whole division, it would have been surprised whoever goes down, really. So, yeah, mm. no, it's a good observation. Yeah, it all sets up for a very potentially exciting final day, uh, which would be good. Yes. Um, finally, moving on to Steve Bone's score prediction corner, we will start with the very man himself, Brian, at home to West Ham this weekend. Steve, how do you see that one going? Well, I think Brighton are top of the Premier League because of me, I think, because <laughs> I, keep, I keep predicting them to draw against lowly teams. I think Deserbia C in this, he's playing these predictions to his team that's inspiring them to go out and win 4-1 every week so with that in mind it's going to be a draw against West Ham 2-2 two, two against West Ham I think this week Baron how do you see that game going at the Amex I just think Brighton are creating um so many chances at the moment I think it's going to be uh, you know as we mentioned earlier their toughest test but I'm going for a 3-1 to Brighton and Mark how do you see Brighton getting on against the Hammers yeah, I'm going 3-1 Brighton as well. But they've got such a good record against West Ham as well, haven't they, Brighton? They do, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think history will play a part in that. And like you say, Brighton are playing so well, um, especially because it's at the Amex. If it was at um, West Ham, I think it might be slightly different. I would go, I would agree with Steve, I think. But because it's at the Amex, I can't see Brighton not winning this one because they've got a couple of tough fixtures. Well, I say tough fixtures coming up and they've got Man United coming up soon. That's not particularly yeah. tough. Yeah, so, Newcastle, yeah, Newcastle, Newcastle, yeah. Newcastle will, will be, I think Newcastle one will be the real sort of measure of where they are, Brighton. So, um, yeah, but I think, I think they will win this weekend and probably quite comfortably. And in League Two, Mark Swindon against Crawley Town. How do you see Scott Lindsay's boys getting on? <clears throat> I think that they'll get something. Yeah. Uh, Swindon, or like I said, they've obviously scoring goals, and they haven't been beaten yet. So I think I think it could be a draw, and I think it will be a one-all draw. Crawley aren't scoring loads, but their defence mm. is very, very good in the midfield as well. Like I say, Jay Williams, mm. Kelly, sort of adding to that defence as well from the midfield. So I, I'm going to go for a one-all draw. Darren, how do you see that one going at Swindon? <clears throat> I think I think Crawley, um, you know, a bit hard done by against Gillingham. So I, th I think they'll they'll sneak it. I think a one-nil win. Um, for Crawley against Scott Lindsay's old team, so I think he'll be fired up, fired a team up, and uh, I think they'll bring you get the three points. And Steve, how do you see that one going? Well, I don't like Swindon Town. I've got to admit, they're one of they're one of, <laughs> they're one of numerous teams throughout the divisions that I don't just don't like. Um, so I'd love to say Crawley are going to win about four 0 but I'm going to remain realistic. I'm going to go for a two two draw in that one. Uh, and uh, well, just on that, I, I'm not a big fan of Swindon either, just because they made me park about 10 minutes away from the ground <laughs> when I had to win their last game of the season and their press box was so uncomfortable. I mean, Craw Crawley's is what it is. Mm. But yeah, I did not enjoy Crawley, uh, Swindon's press box either. So yeah, no, I'm with Steve Bone on that one. Is uh, the car parking situation at Swindon and their press box any reason to go towards your hatred of them, Steve? Or is there more? No, I've, no, I've never been in the press box, actually. I've only ever stood on the away end as a Portsmouth fan. It's, it's my Pompey links, really. Pompey uh, just don't like Swindon. We had a bit of a rivalry going with them for a few years. Um yeah, I just, just don't like. Sorry, I, just, I can't really put any reason on it. I just don't like them. Sorry, sorry, oh, Swindon goodness. fans, if you're watching. Uh, that's fair enough. Um, before we wrap up, chaps, anything else you'd like to mention before we uh, close off? <clears throat> Keep I'm, a big, I'm a huge fan of Swindon Town. <laughs> Somebody has to be one, one of my favourite lower league teams. <laughs> the pride well, of fans, the fans won't like you calling them lower league teams. They're a funny bunch, the Swindon fans. So. <laughs> They won't like calling them lower league, even though that's what they are. I've scuffed it. Yeah. Former Premier League club, aren't they, Mark? They are, yeah. God, it's crazy, isn't it, that they were in the Premier League? Yeah. yeah. Them and Premiership oh, or whatever. Bradford, I think. Was it both in the same division? Former Premier yeah. League? Yeah. Was it Glenn, Glenn, Hoddle? Glenn Hoddle there playing? Yeah. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was, wasn't he? Yeah. They had the likes of Paul Bowden, didn't they? The old Wales Ooh. left back. And um, yeah, I can't remember. John Monker, did he play for them as well? I can't remember. No, he was last there. Oh, I don't know. 
I'm making things up now. Let's let <laughs> I think we better finish it before I start yeah. saying yeah. things. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to wrap things up. Um, you can catch up with all the latest sports news covering everything we talked about today at southsworld.co.uk forward slash sport. Thank you very much uh, for joining us this week, chaps. And I have no opinion on Swindon Town whatsoever. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Cheers. <laughs>